Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. My name is James Jacob Prash from Morial Ministries. We're going to look at the subject today of ending the confusion. There's so much confusion in the church, and a lot of that confusion emanates from a fundamental series of misunderstandings about definitions, about terms, about terms the Bible uses, and about theological terms that have been used in commentaries or lexicons, things by scholars, academics, that alienate, sometimes turn off ordinary Christians as soon as they hear them. Well, don't be intimidated. It's not that complicated. In fact, it's quite simple. I can get intimidated by computers very easily. But I've learned over time, when somebody knows what they're doing, explain something to me, how I was making a mountain out of a molehill, and how I was running away from something that's not that complicated. I'm one of those people that has a good mind for science, but a terrible mind for technology. Don't ask me why. That's me. Things intimidate me. Well, it's not that complicated, is it? There are kids 10, 12, 15 years old who are quite literate in computers. Don't tell me I can't be. Don't tell me you can't be. Biblical exposition is similar. Don't be intimidated. We're going to make this something to simplify the confusion, to help you see it clearly and as straight as possible. By defining the terms in light of what the scripture means, understanding how other groups, sects, cults, sometimes have distorted meanings, and even other Christians have distorted meanings, and practically what it means for us. Thank you so much. Let's end the confusion. This confusion very often comes from not understanding terminology not understanding the definitions of the terms or even of the words of Scripture. In an obvious case of this problem in the modern world, we have New Ages, whose theosophy, as it were, was influenced and has roots in Eastern religion, in Hinduism, mystical Buddhism, shamanism, etc. It masquerades as Christianity in things like the New Apostolic Reformation, or we saw the Kundalini Yoga in the counterfeit revivals of Toronto and Pensacola, and so forth, these things are obviously deceptions of the enemy. They're influenced by what Isaiah warned, my people are filled with influences from the East. The chief influence from the East that has corrupted Scripture the most has been Gnosticism, Gnosticism, from the Greek, Greek word nasos, you claim some kind of mystical insight, which is misrepresented as being spiritual, into the scripture, either ignoring or contradicting text, context, co-text. In other words, instead of being exegetical, what does the thing actually say grammatically, historically, and doctrinally, people read into it things it doesn't say. And the first way that that happens, this is called asegesis, reading things into scripture it doesn't say, as opposed to exegesis, taking out what it does say, what God actually put in there. So you have exegesis, which is good and right, asegesis, which is wrong and false, is Gnosticism. Somebody claims to understand something other people don't see. Now, in the early church, the apostles had the illumination of the Holy Spirit to understand the scriptures and to write the New Testament, which, among other things, explained the teachings of Jesus, explained the gospel, and explained the Old Testament and how it points to and is fulfilled in Christ in both his first coming and his second. The apostles had a special insight from Jesus. To a lesser degree, so did the Hebrew prophets. 
But the satanic effort to counterfeit that insight that the apostles had will always come in the form of Gnosticism, a counterfeit spirituality where it's mysticism pretending to be the Holy Spirit. We have seen this mysticism today in things like Bethel, California with Bill Johnson, the New Apostolic Reformation. These things are Gnostic. They're hermeneutics. That is the way they interpret the Bible. Hermeneutics, the way we interpret Scripture, comes from Gnosticism. It does not come from exegesis. You've seen people in Bethel, California, teaching the Holy Spirit is like a blue genie, and he's playing around. And instead of being the spirit of holiness, Haruaka Kodesh, as the scripture teaches, he becomes a playful blue genie. Uh, how do they get this? They don't get it from scripture. They get it from reading things into scripture. Scripture does not say Gnostic. It's Gnostic. It's not the illumination of the Holy Spirit. Now, there's New Age, and then there's New Age getting into the church. Let's begin with New Age. I've witnessed the New Ages many times. I used to go to a, a beach in, in, in Maui, in, in Hawaii, and New Ages went there chanting at the sun. These are Westerners. They'd be smoking cannabis, they'd be naked with tattoos, and they'd be singing and pounding on drums and dancing, and they saw a spiritual dimension to this. When you witness to these people in their spirituality as they see it, if you were to tell them you were born again, they would say they were born again. Only they would mean reincarnation, not second birth in Jesus. If you were to say you reap what you sow, they would say, yes, you reap what you sow. But to them, that's karma, karma. If you were to say you believe in the Holy Spirit, they would say they believe in the Holy Spirit. Only to them, the Holy Spirit is the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age. If you say you believed in sin, they would say they believe in sin. To them, sin is giving place to negative energy, negative thought. They would use the same terms. You tell them, I saw the light, meaning Jesus. They will say, they saw the light, the cosmic illumination of the inner self. Now again, these New Age concepts come from Hinduism and from mystical Buddhism and to a degree from certain aspects of Sufi Islam, Zoroastrianism, etc. But they come from Eastern religion. That's where they come from. People will use the same terms, but mean something different by them. That's easy to deal with when you're dealing with a new agent. But it gets more complicated when you deal with people who use or misuse the scripture. Mormonism will use scripture in conjunction with the Book of Mormon, and they will mean different things by the same terms. Different things by the same terms. Jesus is the Son of God, but they believe that Jesus is the spirit brother of Satan. The scripture says he's the monogenes, the only begotten of the Father. Again, they'll use the same term, but mean something different. They'll talk about Adam and Eve, but they believe Adam and Eve are different. They believe Adam was God who became a man. But they use the same terms. This is true of cults such as the Christadelphians. It's true of the Jehovah's Witnesses. They will use the same terms we do. Jehovah's Kingdom. Well, what the scripture means by Jehovah's Kingdom is the rule of God. On heaven and on earth, ultimately, it'll be on earth as it is in heaven. No, to them means it's their organization, the Watchtower Society. That's Jehovah's Kingdom. But they'll use the same term as a believer will. In Roman Catholicism, it becomes very complicated. The Gnosticism of Roman Catholicism is called census plenior, the fuller sense. 
So Mary, the mother of Jesus, Miriam, in the Magnificat, blessed are you among women and the first words out of her mouth. Your baby is going to redeem his people from their sin. And she says, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Mary says she needs to be saved from sin by her own confession. That's her response to Gabriel. A pope comes claiming to have this authority erroneously from Peter to interpret the scriptures even infallibly called ex cathedra and says, oh no, the Immaculate Conception or Muni Pacentesimus Deus. Mary was conceived without sin. She didn't need to be saved. Or Mary was assumed into heaven. She had her own bodily resurrection from the dead. Again, it's not exegesis. It's not even asegesis. It's invented. I have a mystical insight into it. They claim he's speaking from the Holy Spirit, but he isn't. He's contradicting Mary. He's contradicting the New Testament but he's the Pope. The Pope is to Catholicism what a guru is in Hinduism. People will listen to him as if he's somehow infallible. Jehovah's Witnesses will listen to the Watchtower Society. They will listen to proven con artists like Brigham Young and Charles Tazzy Russell. They will listen to the teachings of the founders of Mormonism like Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. Um, they do this. The Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons always do this. Islam will listen to the teachings of Muhammad. Whenever you see a man in place of Christ, that is an antichrist. Not the antichrist, but an antichrist. And a type, either historically or scripturally, of the coming antichrist at the close of the age the man of lawlessness. Be that as it may, they all have an antichrist. But there's another term for antichrist that many Christians forget, which we deal with on our teaching tape or teaching recording, the plastic Bible. It is the pseudo-logon. Jesus is the logos. He is the scripture incarnate. The scripture is Jesus in print. He's the logos. But wherever you have antichrist religion, and where you have Gnostic revelation, Gnosticism, counterfeiting the revelation of the Holy Spirit through God's word, you're going to have a pseudologon. It can be a papal encyclical. It can be Talmud. It can be the Bhagavad Gita. It can be the Book of Mormon. It can be the Watchtower. They all have a pseudo logon. Call it the Koran, call it the Book of Mormon, call it a papal encyclical. It is all claiming to have equal doctrinal authority with the Word of God, even when it contradicts the Word of God. Muslims will tell you that the Koran speaks of Jesus more than it does Muhammad. They're correct, it does. Except most of what it says about Jesus, in fact, nearly all about it what it says about Jesus, contradicts what the New Testament says. Jesus didn't die on the cross. Judas did. God has no son. Jesus is inferior to Muhammad. Oh, it talks about Jesus, but a different Jesus. The Mormons talk about a Jesus who's the spirit brother of Satan, a different Jesus. The Jehovah's Witness Jesus is Michael the Archangel. They'll talk about Jesus, but they mean the Archangel Michael. When you have a false Christ, you'll have a false Logos. Where there's a false Christ, there's inevitably going to be a false Logos. Now, we can talk about New Age. We can talk about cults, Roman Catholicism. Let's talk about Judaism. What today is called Judaism, the synagogue with the rabbi, be it Reformed, be it Conservative, Orthodox, Ultra-Orthodox, or one of the Hasidic sects, 
it's the same phenomenon. They put the authority that belongs to the Messiah alone into the hand of some rabbi who denied the messiahship of Yeshua. The pseudologons of what we call Judaism, Talmud, uh, certainly the Kabbalistic writings such as the Zohar, this is a pseudologon. When you reject the true Messiah, you get a false one. In other words, what I'm saying is this. Just as Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy and mainstream liberal Protestantism, like the World Council of Churches and things of that nature, just the same as they are not scriptural Christianity, Talmudic Judaism is not scriptural Judaism. Scriptural Judaism is mosaic. You read the Hebrew scriptures, you will not find a synagogue or a rabbi. Yet they call Moses Moshe Rabbeinu. There was no such teaching in the Torah. They invented another religion after the Messiah was rejected in fulfillment of the prophecies of Jeremiah chapter 2. Don't call it Judaism. Call it Rabbinism. Talmudic Judaism is Rabbinism. It is not scriptural Judaism. That is, it is not Mosaic Judaism. It does not come from the Torah. It perverts Torah. Now, why do unsaved Jewish people, particularly the religious, reject Yeshua, Jesus? Remember, the popular Jewish rejection of Jesus, even by the rabbis, especially by the Orthodox rabbis, is the consequence of the problem. It is the tragic result, the ramification of the problem, the tragic result of the problem, but it's not the problem. The problem is, as Jesus said in John 5, if you believed Moses, you'd believe me also. The problem is not that the rabbis reject Yeshua. That's the result of the problem. That's the consequence of it. That's the tragic ramification. The problem is they reject Moses and the Torah. They don't believe Torah. If they believed Moses and the Hebrew prophets, they'd know Yeshua is the Messiah. It's another religion. Hence, the term Judaism. When you say Judaism, you must draw a distinction between mosaic, that is, scriptural Judaism, based on the Hebrew scriptures, and rabbinism, which is Talmudic. So, too, just as Judaism has become rabbinic instead of mosaic, mainstream Christianity has become Christendom. Mainstream Protestantism, certainly Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy. It is not apostolic. The doctrines are not from the apostles alone. It is patristic, patristic. Know the term patristic. It comes from the church fathers. Now, some of the early church fathers before the Council of Nicaea were important historical sources. People like Irenaeus, Hegesippus, Papias, for historical reasons, they're well worth reading. But after Nicaea particularly, the church fathers took the church further and further away from scriptural Christianity, from the Jewish Christianity of the first century Christians. I don't mean as being under the law. I simply mean showing Yeshua, Jesus, as the fulfillment of the law. The later church fathers took Christianity from being a Judaic theology and turned it into a Greek philosophy. This was true particularly of Augustine of Hippo and those who influenced Augustine, Ambrose of Milan being one, another being Cyprian of, Car Cyprian of Carthage, the sacramentalist. In the Eastern Church, it was John Chrysostom. The church went further and further away in the patristic era, the time of the church fathers. 
we must understand the difference between the terms apostolic and patristic. This gets complicated because you have evangelical Protestants, or at least those claiming to be, claiming to be born again. Born again Anglicans, Lutherans who would claim to be regenerate in some cases, Presbyterians, yet they accept patristic authority the way the Jews accept Talmudic authority. When Calvin wrote his Institutes of the Christian Religion, he repeatedly said, by the authority of Augustine, by the authority of Augustine, by the authority of Augustine. Augustine had no authority. He was not an apostle to whom Jesus gave the authority and commissioned them to write the New Testament and to write the Gospels. He had no authority to define doctrine. None. He platonized the church. I'm not saying he didn't say true things and do some good things and opposing certain heretics, such as Pelagianism and so forth, but he was a Platonist. Thomas Aquinas was an Aristotelian, as was the Rabbi Rambam, Moses Maimonides. One of the things that happens, what we have to draw a distinction between, is theology, the study of God through his word, and theological Philosophy. Philosophy. Understand that Calvinism, Calvinism, theologically has more in common with Islam than it does Judeo-Christian dogma. In Calvinism, God creates certain people to go to hell to torture them forever. Jesus said, hell is a place prepared for Satan and his angels. We are told in the Hebrew scriptures that the Lord does not take any delight in the death of the wicked. He wants them to repent. Calvinism is like Islam. Islam, it's inja Allah. Anything that happens is God's perfect will, or their Allah, Nabataean moon God's perfect will. Calvinism is the same. Theologically, Calvinism is more akin, in fact, it is almost identical in certain respects to Islam. Calvin had a theocratic police state with morals police that behaved exactly like the Mutawa, like the religious police in Saudi Arabia. I've been there. They do the same things. They did the same things as the Taliban did and, and, and so forth in Afghanistan in enforcing Sharia, Islamic law. The same thing happened in Calvin's Geneva. Why did the Calvinists behave like the Muslims? Because they believed the same thing. Theologically, Calvinism is more Islamic than Christianity. Most jihads in the Muslim world are Muslims killing other Muslims. Why the most jihads, holy wars, Muslims killing other Muslims, not just the infidel? Well, you know, in Great Britain, the Scottish Presbyterian Calvinists and the English Puritan Calvinists massacred each other in the name of Jesus Christ with the great Puritan theologian John Owen as his advisor, Cromwell's Puritans went to war against the Presbyterians. Not just Christian against Christian, Protestant against Protestant, Calvinist against Calvinist, murdering each other in the name of Jesus Christ, the same as what you see between Sunni and Shia Muslims today. Why do they behave the same way? Because they believe the same thing as Muslims. Same thing? Well, separate subject, I only mentioned it in passing. But understand, that's the theology. What Calvinism really is, is a 16th century humanist philosophy pretending to be a first century Judeo-Christian theology. Theologically, it is more Islamic than Christian. Understand the difference between a philosophy and a theology. The value of philosophy is that it has an apologetic value in communicating the gospel, in presenting an apologia, an apologetic for the empirical evidence for the scripture. You can put theology into 
philosophical terms to evangelize people, but you better be careful with your terms and don't turn the theology into a philosophy, which is what the post I see in church fathers did, which is what the papacy certainly did, which is what the Eastern Orthodox Church certainly did, and it is what most of the reformers did. Understand the terms, theology and philosophy. They are different. Now, this determinism that the Calvinists had and that the Muslims had came from the Sadducees. The Sadducees were determinists. Jesus, on that point, agreed with the Pharisees. He said, the Son of Man must be betrayed by, for it is written, but woe by him by whom he is betrayed. Judas was personally culpable, even though his action was predicted. Okay, this is called an antimony, an antimony. Two truths that appear to be mutually exclusive are simultaneously held in tension. God foreknows the future, and he foreknew what Judas would do, but that does not negate the personal choice of Judas. Islam says it does. Or Calvinism, certainly hyper-Calvinism, says it does. The Sadducees said it would have. The Pharisees said all is foreseen, but the choice is given. On that point, Jesus agreed more with the Pharisees than with the Sadducees. None of these things are new. We must understand predestination is simply the reformed Calvinistic Protestant version of what Muslims call Inja Allah and of what Judaism called Sadduceic determinism. But it's all the same. Determinism, predestination, he makes some for hell, some for heaven, and then Inja Allah. Well, if he went to hell, it was God's perfect will. Or she went to hell, it was God's perfect will. Understand the terms. Now, when cults use biblical terms with a wrong definition, it's important to understand that they mean different things by the same terms. When New Agers use biblical terms in an unscriptural way, it's important to understand that they mean something different than we do. When Roman Catholics use scriptural terms in an unscriptural way and mean something different by them, we have to understand what they mean. For instance, in ecumenical dialogue, say with a Jesuit scholar and a Protestant academic, the Protestant might say something like, if he's conservative, we believe salvation is by grace. Yes, we torch the Jesuit. Salvation is by grace. Only he has a different definition of grace. In the New Testament, the Greek word charism means God's gift. In Hebrew, it's chesed, God's covenant mercy. And in English, it's undeserved favor. In Roman Catholicism, grace is an ethereal substance that is earned by sacramental ritual in some way. You work for your own salvation, effectuated by sacramental rituals. An ex opere operato, as it's called in Latin, effect of the ritual to save you. Sprinkling an infant gives it salvation without any personal confession of faith, so they bring in surrogate godparents, all this kind of stuff. Catholics will use the same terms. Jesus made it very clear. False Christ will come, and if anybody says, I've returned physically, before the parousia, before his actual return, and he's coming back the way he went, in the air, the saints with him, if anybody says, I've come back physically before that, it's a false Christ, don't believe it. Yet every time there's a mass, the Roman Catholic Church says Jesus has returned physically under the appearances of bread and wine via transubstantiation. They actually believe the priest has a power to turn bread and wine 
into protoplasmic body and blood of Jesus Christ, even though it looks like bread and wine and tastes like it and smells like it. This comes from Aristotle's philosophy of accidents that is, of course, debunked by modern chemistry and physics. In the Middle Ages and in the ancient world, before the Enlightenment, it was all alchemy. They didn't draw a distinction between chemistry and magic. You've got sodium and you've got chlorine, and you combine them, you've got table salt, sodium chloride. We know it's sodium chloride. It's a compound. They didn't understand that. They said, no, it's <laughs> sodium and it's chlorine. It just looks like and tastes like salt. But we know we combined it chemically and some kind of magic happened. They thought that the movement of electrons between the orbitals, between the shells of atoms, and the forming of compounds and covalency and so forth, they saw this as magic. Now this is of course debunked by modern chemistry and physics, completely debunked. The philosophy of accidents is absolute rubbish. But in Roman Catholicism, it's known as a de fede doctrine. They can't change it, even though everybody in their right mind knows it's nonsense. Catholics will say, we accept it by faith. Originally, they didn't accept it by faith. They thought that's what it was organically, chemically, protoplasmically. They thought it was the physiological and anatomical body and blood of Christ under the appearances. Well, Jesus said... If another comes and says, I'm the return of Christ physically, don't believe it. But when there's a mass, they call it the Blessed Sacrament. Jesus has returned physically. They bow down to it, they worship it, and they pray to it as Christ incarnate. And then he dies sacramentally in a ritual that continues Calvary in some way, that's undefined. He dies sacramentally, and they eat him cannibalistically. Well, that's his real blood. Well, if it is, why are you drinking it? In Acts chapter 15, the apostles condemned the consumption of blood. The Holy Spirit told them not to do it. If you really believe that's his blood, why are you practicing a vampire religion that the New Testament and the apostles said not to do? But it's all Gnostic. We have an insight and an understanding you don't have. The Eucharistic Christ, the Mormon Christ, one of Roman Catholicism, one of Mormonism, the Jehovah's Witness Christ, who's Michael, the Islamic Christ, who's the prophet inferior to Muhammad, the cosmic Christ of Matriya and the New Ages. They've all got a Christ. They've all got a Jesus Christ, a lot of day saints, spirit brother of Satan, but it's not the one of Scripture. This brings us to the term Christology. Christology. What do the Scriptures really teach about Christ. Theology. What do the scriptures really teach about God? Pneumatology. Pneumatology. What do the scriptures really teach about the Holy Spirit? When you have false religion, cults, Eastern religions, and Eastern religions invading the church, you are always going to have, ultimately, some kind of false Christology and false pneumatology. A wrong view of the Holy Spirit, a wrong view of the Lord Jesus, false theology, a wrong view of God, and a pseudo-logon, a false scripture and a wrong view of the scripture. But it all comes from the same terms, they use the same terms but mean something different by them. Oh, grace! What do you mean by grace? Is it an ethereal substance earned by the sacraments, as you say? Or is it God's gift, God's undeserved favor, his covenant mercy, as the scriptures say? Oh, we shouldn't argue and bicker about words. No, we should not argue and bicker about semantics. But we should certainly define our terms. Remember, the priests of Baal worshipped a Baal who rose from the dead every spring. He had holy days, the same holy days as the Hebrews had for Moses. 
Only instead of thanking the true God for the rain and the sun and the harvest, they were thanking other gods. Mosaic Judaism was in large part a polemic against Canaanite religion, but they had a Baal. But you know what? The Hebrew scripture says that Yahweh is Baal. Hebrew word for husband, master, and owner. Israel's Baal, we're told in prophets like Hosea, is Yahweh, is the father of Jesus, is the God of Israel. He's the real Baal, but the Canaanites with Jezebel and so forth had a false Baal, but they called him Baal. Is it the same Baal? No, it's different. Remember, in the, in the Mexico City telephone directory, there's 80,000 people named Jesus. The Eucharistic Jesus of Rome? <laughs> It's not the real Jesus. The Michael, the archangel, the angelic Jesus of Jehovah's Witnesses is not the real Jesus. The spirit brother of Satan of the Mormons is not the real Jesus. The prophet inferior to Muhammad Isa in Islam is not the real Jesus. The cosmic Christ of the New Ages of Matriya, this is not the real Jesus, but they're all named Jesus. We must understand our terms. Not only is their Christology wrong, their pneumatology is wrong. Their doctrine of the spirit. Most frequently, it is the spirit of the age, the zeitgeist, counterfeiting the Holy Spirit. For instance, we live in an age of consumerism. Online purchases, Amazon accounts, go online. Put your credit card in once, they've got your record. Buy this, buy that, buy the other thing. Order what you want online, it'll be delivered to your door. This is consumerism. This can be yours, this can be yours, this can be yours. In the United States, in Japan, in South Korea, and in Canada, there are whole television channels with no programming, only commercials. Give us this, give us your number, you can have this, we're going to give you this, this, this doll, this kitchen appliance, this device for your automobile, one thing after another. It's consumerism. Name it and claim it, blab it and grab it, this can be yours. So the word faith money teaches, they come in that same spirit. We deal with this in our book, The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea. All they have is a consumerist Christianity. Scripturally, it's what church is God going to use you to meet the needs of others? In consumerist Christianity, what church is going to meet your need? You're asking the wrong question. Scripturally, he who waters will himself be watered. When you're looking for a church, it's, Lord, where do you want me to go to be used by you to meet the need of others? Oh no, what church is going to meet your need? In the States, they actually run TV commercials for churches competing with each other for parishioners, for attendees, as if they were two rival supermarkets trying to get customers away from each other. The spirit of the age. This is a false pneumatology. There are churches that have run on pyramid schemes like Amway. The whole thing in Australia with the, the, the Phil Pringle and things like this, people have gotten into this stuff. It is unbelievable. It is false. They mean different things by the same term. Other terms, worship. In Hebrew, it's hishtak vaya, to bow down. The idea is giving God the worship he deserves. Worship today has been redefined as entertainment, musical entertainment. That's what they call worship. It's not hymns of worship like Charles Wesley. And again, I have no problem with contemporary Christian music as long as the lyrics are scriptural and so forth. But when you sing people Hillsong, an organization filled with sex scandal and financial scandal, broadcast on national TV in Australia, when they have the naked cowboy at their women's conference in New York and all these kinds of terrible things, and pedophilia and covering it up and the Royal Commission saying that the Houstons are guilty of these things and of not protecting the children and the church. This was Hillsong. 
This is not worship, it's a business and it's entertainment. Instead of getting their doctrine from the exposition of scripture, they sing choruses repetitively, something Jesus said not to do. This causes something called the mesmero in Greek from the book of Galatians. It mesmerizes. It puts the evil eye on people. You keep saying something and confessing it till you believe it, even if it isn't true. I've seen this like with the river song from Pensacola. None of the lyrics were scriptural. You've got these songs. What they're singing is not true. Now, in the New Apostolic Reformation, as in the Restoration Movement, its predecessor in, in Great Britain in the 1980s, it's the same thing. It's not only cults who use biblical terms and mean something else. It's not only New Agers who do that. It's not only the Roman Church who does that. It is people who claim to be born again. People caught up in the errors of dominion theology. When they say things like dominion and kingdom authority, they mean things entirely different than the scripture does. What they're teaching essentially is a form of post-millennialism, that the church is going to be triumphant now before the return of Christ. In other words, instead of the seed of the woman destroying the enemy, as God promised when man fell in Genesis 3, instead of Romans 16, the Lord of glory will trample Satan under your feet. No, the victorious church is going to do it prior to his return. This is known as over-realized eschatology. Over-realized eschatology. Kingdom now, triumphalism, dominionism. It has undergirded much of the thinking in things like IHOP, the International House of Prayer, with Mike Bickle and these people. It certainly was the basis of the Restoration Movement and of much of the present New Apostolic Reformation. But it's not scriptural. They mean something different by the terms kingdom authority, kingdom power. They mean something different by the terms dominion than the word of God does, even though they're using the scriptural terms. Well, let's go further with this. When cults do it, when New Agers do it, when the Church of Rome does it, it's one thing. But when people who say that they're evangelicals or they're born again do it, we got a real problem, we have a real problem. But it's not a new problem. Look with me, please, to the book of Revelation, chapter 13, very briefly. When the Antichrist comes and there's an onslaught of persecution, we're told in verse 10, here is the perseverance and the faith of the saints. That term is repeated in the book of Revelation, chapter 14, the next chapter, verse 12, during this time of persecution, here is the perseverance of the saints. Do I believe in perseverance of the saints? Absolutely, as the scripture teaches it. Do I believe in the perseverance of the saints in the way that Calvinism has perverted it? Contemporary Calvinism, since the time of the remonstrance of Dort, since the followers of Calvin like Beza, but particularly since the remonstrance of Dort, have redefined perseverance of the saints to mean unconditional, once saved, always saved. Now that's another issue in itself. But even if you believe it, that's not what perseverance of the saints means. It's part of their anachronism from the tulip. Total depravity, <laughs> you know, Undeserved grace, okay. Limited atonement, Jesus didn't die for everybody. Okay. Irresistible grace, if you're made for heaven, you're made for heaven, and if you're made for hell, you're going to hell. And P, perseverance of the saints, you can't fall away. Unconditional one saved, always saved. That's the perseverance of the saints, says Calvinism, says Reformed churches. Well, generally speaking, Reformed, Reformed means Calvinist. 
Presbyterian Church, United Reformed Church, Church of Scotland, Reformed Baptist. The term Reformed generally means Calvinist. However, as you see, the term perseverance of the saints has nothing whatsoever to do in Scripture in context with once saved, always saved, whether you believe it or not. I personally do believe in once saved, always saved. I just do not believe it is unconditional. I do not believe in unconditional once saved, always saved. But I do believe in the eternal security of the believer if he or she remains in Christ. Take off the life jacket, the garments of salvation. You take off the life jacket. I hope you're a real good swimmer. Nobody's ever made it so far. Keep the jacket on. You're going to be saved. Keep wearing the robes of righteousness and the garments of salvation. You have an eternal security, an assurance of salvation. Now, Roman Catholicism says if you claim to have the assurance of salvation, You've committed the son of presumption. Calvinists say, if you don't believe that you can't take the garments off, <laughs> that you don't have the perseverance of the saints. It means you're not a, ever, never a believer to begin with. But that's not what perseverance means. That's not what, even what it says. It's talking about the persecution of believers at the time of Antichrist. Here's the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandment of Jesus. Here's the perseverance of the saints, Revelation 13, Revelation 14. They simply extract a term from Scripture and invent a meaning of their own and assign a false, unscriptural meaning to it. That is the basis of how Calvinism has operated hermeneutically in the way they've mishandled the scriptures. Now, of course, I make a distinction between moderate Calvinists and extreme ones, but that's not what perseverance of the saints means. But it gets worse than that. John Calvin himself never taught this tulip. John Calvin taught something called covenant theology. The basis of Calvin's Calvinism was not the tulip. It was covenant theology. God only ever made two covenants. One with Adam and one with Abraham. Not the old and new. They're subordinate to, Abra to the Abrahamic covenant. God only made two covenants. The old and the new? No. The one with Adam and the one with Abraham. Now, obviously, this conveys an inherent error of replacement theology. But it also demeans the distinction between the two covenants that we see in the Gospels and the Epistle of Hebrews. This is the cup of the new covenant. Jeremiah 31 predicts when the Messiah comes, there'll be a new covenant. The Epistle to the Hebrews emphatically reiterates we have a new and better covenant. Oh no, it's not about the old and the new, says Calvin. John Calvin said it's about the covenant with Abraham and the covenant with Adam. Well, where does the scripture say explicitly that God only made two covenants with Adam and with Abraham? Well, it doesn't. Calvin invented it. Remember, he used philosophy, not theology. Covenant theology was Calvin's Calvinism. Tulip is modern Calvinism's Calvinism. They're two different Calvinisms. Reformed generally means Calvinistic. Dutch Reformed Church, Presbyterian Church, United Reformed Church, and the Reformed branch of Evangelical Anglicanism, among others. Well, let's continue. Let's continue. Synergism. Synergism says salvation is a result of both the actions of God and the actions of man. That we play a role in our own salvation. Roman Catholicism teaches synergism. Anything that believes in salvation by works 
alone is not synergism. It trusts in the righteousness of man. Synergism combines the efforts of man with the righteousness and grace of God. Synergism. As I've explained multiple times, here is how it works. Is synergism true or false? Do we participate in our own salvation or don't we? First of all, it doesn't come by sacraments. Secondly, we do not atone in purgatory for our own sin as the Roman Church teaches. Roman Catholicism is a fundamental denial of the scriptural gospel. The blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. We don't pay for our own. Forget Catholicism. It is not scriptural Christianity. It is to Christendom what rabbinism is to Judaism. A combination of things that are human invention and even pagan hybrid with the scriptures. Sort of like what the Samaritans did in the Old Testament, mixing pagan belief and inventions of their own with the perverted version of the Torah, of the Pentateuch. Samaritanism was very much like Old Testament, like an Old Testament version of Catholicism, combining the unscriptural with the scriptural, using things scriptural like terminology to camouflage or masquerade things which are not scriptural, yet presenting it as if it's all scriptural. The Samaritans did that. There's still some Samaritans in Israel who do that. But Roman Catholicism is based on it, as is Eastern Orthodoxy. So we go back to synergism. What role do we play in our salvation, or do we play any? Let's deal with synergism. I said this many times. My apologies to those who've heard it. I happen to be in Britain at the moment, not too far from the English Channel. Every year, there's a race of people who swim from Calais in France across the English Channel to the White Cliffs of Dover or vice versa. The Channel Swimmers. Hypothetically, although it's happened, one year there's tremendous gale forces and a thunderstorm unexpectedly breaks out. The waves become tumultuous. There's one swimmer going into muscle fatigue they are not only swallowing salt water, they're beginning to have respiratory deficit. They are drowning. They are totally out of strength and energy. They're going down, they're going to die. They can maybe see the white cliffs of Dover in the distance, but they could never reach it. And then with the mist and the rain, they can't even see where they're going anymore. They can't see the white cliffs, and they certainly have no direction no sense of direction where Normandy, where the north of France even is. So in their desperation, they call out, God, help me, God, help me, oh, Jesus, please save me. And all of a sudden, a helicopter appears and comes under the cloud line, and in the midst of the storm, hatch opens up, and a Jewish gentleman with a beard sticks his head out. He says, who are you? He says, well, you called me. I'm Jesus. I'm the Savior. Oh, Jesus, thank you for hearing my prayer. Please save me. Please save me, Jesus. Jesus says, you realize you're going to drown. There's nothing you can do to save yourself. Nothing. I know that, Jesus. I gotta do it for you. If I don't do it, you're dead, you're finished. Yes, Jesus, I understand. I'll do whatever you say. Please save me. I have to save you. You're gonna listen to me, yes? Yes, Jesus. All right, put this on. And again, he throws in this life jacket, and the swimmer puts it on. The jacket is what Isaiah called the garments of salvation, the robe of righteousness. He puts it on. Now he's got the life jacket on and he can float in the storm. He's buoyant despite the muscle fatigue. Okay, Jesus, what do I do now? Keep swimming. Straight ahead. White cliffs of Dover that way. Keep swimming. 
Don't take the life jacket off. Don't feel you're getting stronger and you can make it on your own as your muscles, muscle mass regenerates its strength as the chemicals in the sliding filaments of the muscle fiber reinvigorate you and you think you can make it in your own strength once again. No, 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 you can't. You're going to drown if you take that jacket off. Keep it on and do what I tell you and I guarantee you're going to make it to the White Cliffs of Dover. You have eternal security. I guarantee it. Now, I gave this jacket to you. You didn't earn it. I bought it for you with my own blood on the cross. I died your death to give you my life. I took your sin to give you my righteousness. I bought you those garments. You did not earn them. You could never earn them. You understand? Yes, Jesus. Now, put them on and swim. It's a gift. You didn't earn it. But you must act on it. Do not believe that it's all by grace means we don't have to act on what we were given. Scripturally, it's all by grace means we didn't earn the grace. We didn't earn the salvation. We didn't earn the forgiveness. We didn't earn the eternal life. But we must act upon that which we were given. I know whom I believeth, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him until that day. Synergism. Now, the opposite systematic theology, systematic theology are the ways that people have designed academically or scholars have concocted in order to try to explain God's dealings with man. Calvinism, again, is Reformed theology, and in Calvin's original belief system, it was covenant theology. One with Adam, one with Abraham. The opposite is dispensationalism. Dispensationalism. Many Baptists, to a degree Pentecostal, certainly the Plymouth Brethren and so forth are based on dispensationalism. Dispensationalism makes the opposite error. It confuses covenant with dispensation, called economies of grace. They say that the first dispensation was innocence. Man had no sin. Then after man sinned, it was conscience. God dealt with people on an individual basis as he did with Enoch. And then after that, after the flood, it was human government. With Noah, God instituted human government. Then there was the patriarchal promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There was the patriarchal dispensation. Then there was the law, the Torah of Moses, given to the house of Israel when they came out of Egypt. Okay. Then there's the new covenant. Okay. <laughs> then there's going to be a millennial one. There's different dispensations of grace, different ages. Well, they don't agree with each other how many there are. I would say, well, if a dispensation equals a covenant, what about God's covenant with David? Is there a Davidic dispensation? What you have is this. In systematic theology, the Calvinists, the Reformed people, they overstate the continuity between the Old and New Covenants. They overstate the continuity. Abraham is the father of all who believe, but they overstate it. Dispensationalism overstates the discontinuity. It overstates the discontinuity. It makes too radical of a separation between the church and Israel. Now, dispensationalism has a basic truth. But there are two dispensations, the Old Covenant and the New. These other schemes they've invented have an element of truth in them, as does the Abrahamic and the Adamic. They have elements of truth, but they are not systematic theologies except in the minds of men. 
not in the mind of God. Systematic theology, dispensationalism, and Calvinism. Now, hyper-Calvinism and hyper-dispensationalism. Those who take hyper-Calvinism to an extreme believe in infant baptism. They will sprinkle babies and they will make baptism the equivalent of Jewish circumcision. It's completely crazy. Absolutely wrong. Two different rites of passage for two different covenants. It was a national covenant with Israel, a theocratic state where you were born into it. In the new covenant, you must be born again into it. You cannot say, I was born into a Christian family, therefore I'm a Christian. No, God has no grandchildren, only children. Now, the children of believers are set apart from the children of non-believers to a degree through the faith of their parents until such time as they accept Christ personally. But to baptize them? We're baptized into his death. Who in their right mind would take a baby out of a crib or out of a pram and put it in a coffin and bury it if it wasn't dead? It's absurd. Infant baptism is absurd. One of the worst things you can do is baptize a child and tell him he's a Christian because he was baptized. And then when he becomes a teenager, you tell him he has to become a Christian and be born again. This is pure folly. Remember, the reformers like Luther never completely broke with the false teachings of Roman Catholicism. This came about, again, because of wrong terms. The kingdom of God becomes the church. But Jesus said his kingdom is not of this world. Yes, but once Constantine pseudo-Christianized the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire is the children of God. The Roman Empire is the people of God. The Roman Empire is the kingdom of God. Therefore, you're born into the kingdom. The church is the new Israel, replacement theology, supersessionism. Baptize the babies as you circumcise them under the law. One's the equivalent of the other. Now, Catholicism does this. But you actually have hyper-Calvinists who do the same thing. They practice infant baptism. Most absurd, ludicrous, hideous are the closed brethren, the exclusive brethren who follow John Nelson Darby. They are extreme dispensationalists, yet they baptize infants. They do something that is completely anti-dispensational. These are confused people. Darby was a confused man. Yet people follow him. Let's talk about hyperdispensationalism. Hyperdispensationalism is different than dispensationalism, the same as hyper Calvinism is different than ordinary Calvinism. There are moderate Calvinists like Charles Spurgeon. God save thy elect, please elect more. We can live with that. But some made for heaven, some made for hell. In their wrong thinking, Calvinists say, we're not saved by grace through faith. God regenerates you spontaneously. He makes you born again. Then you get the faith. This is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. That's not what the scriptures say at all. That's not how somebody gets saved. An unsaved person is spiritually dead. That is true. They cannot respond to Christ unless the Lord quickens them. Suzo Poel. God puts a measure of life back into the corpse. A corpse cannot speak, cannot hear, cannot think, cannot do anything. It's dead. But two things happen when somebody is born again. The first is Suzo Poel. They are quickened. God puts a measure of life back in the corpse. And the second is eklentos, a conviction of the Holy Spirit of their sin and their need for repentance and forgiveness and salvation through Christ. 
Somebody cannot be born again, cannot become a Christian, unless there is a suzo poeo and an acrentos. God must revive them and draw them. No one comes as the Father draws him. Synergism says, you see, we must participate in it. No, no, no. It's the Lord who does the quickening. A corpse can't bring itself back to life. A corpse does not do the quickening. Christ does. Just like Lazarus, roll away the stone. Lazarus, come forth. The dead must hear the voice of Christ. They're, we are dead in our sins, it says in Ephesians 2. In the Bible, dead bodies, corpses are figures of unsaved people. When we witness, evangelize, give our testimony, hand somebody a tract, we're only rolling away the stone. As in the resurrection of Lazarus, Jesus had to call him from death to life. Evangelism, we roll away the stone. Jesus tells us to roll away the stone, preach the gospel. But they must hear his voice, not ours. When that happens, there's the suzo poeo, a resuscitation of the dead, and an eclectos, a conviction of the spirit. At that point, a corpse that could not respond now must make a choice. God has resuscitated the corpse enough for it to make a decision. Choose this day whom you will serve. It could never make the decision, never make the choice if it wasn't resuscitated. God had to do that. Christ had to pay the price for their sin. He had to die their death to give them his life. He had to take our sin to give us his righteousness and give us his life. He did it all, but we must respond to it. Hence, both the synergism that we can do it is false. But the idea that we don't have to respond to it, we're just made born again, God regenerates us, and then we're Christians. And we get faith, that's nonsense. Or that a ritual, a sacrament, can just resuscitate and make us Christian. This is nonsense. So we go back to the hyper-dispensationalism of John Darby, a confused man. There's nothing more anti-dispensational, logically, than sprinkling an infant. Because dispensationalism separates the old covenant from the new radically. What John Darby did was he took the hermeneutics, the matter of interpreting the Bible, of an ancient heretical sect called the Marcionites, Marcionism. He did not believe their false Christology or false things about Jesus as they did, but he mishandled scripture along the same line, drawing this radical distinction between the God of the Old Covenant and the New. John Darby, for instance, and his followers taught the epistle of James is actually part of the Old Testament, essentially. It's to the 12 tribes in Israel. No, it was written to the church at a time when all believers nearly were Jewish. <laughs> that's why it's addressed to the 12 tribes. No, no, no that's, that's, for the old, that's, that's for the old covenant Jews. It's not for us. Well, John Darby would teach, did teach the Sermon on the Mount, or at least most of it major portions of the Sermon on the Mount, that's not for us, that's for unbelieving Jewish people. That's not for Christians. The Sermon on the Mount's not for Christians. This is what Darby taught. Well, Darby took the same Neo-Marcionite hermeneutic and misapplied it to the Olivet Discourse, things like Luke 21 and Matthew 24, and he said, this is not for the church, this is not for Christians. This is for unsaved Jews. <laughs> the church would be raptured before the tribulation, and this is to the Jews, talking about the, it's not for Christians. The same false hermeneutic, the same spiritually and theologically bankrupt mishandling of Scripture of Darby and the hyper-dispensationalists that said the epistle of James is not part of the New Testament, or that said the Sermon on the Mount is not part of the New Testament it's for Israel, they say the same thing about Matthew 24. Anybody who's pre-tribulational has to come to terms with a lot of things. If you believe Jesus is coming before the tribulation and there's a pre-trib rapture, 
you have to embrace the hermeneutics of John Darby. His hermeneutics not only say Matthew 24 is not for Christians, but for unsaved Jews. The Sermon on the Mount is not for Christians. You believe the Sermon on the Mount is not for Christians? Well, Darby did. That's how he says Matthew 24 isn't. You believe the Epistle of James is not for Christians? Well, Darby did. Now, Charles Spurgeon took out full-page ads in the newspaper in London warning the public about Darby, that he was a despot and a false teacher. Spurgeon took out full-page ads warning about Darby. Many of Darby's followers, people like George Mueller, who took care of the orphans in, in Bristol, and, and, and the most educated of the Brethren Scholars, Dr. Samuel Tregellis, who had an earned doctorate in Greek, they said Darby was a, a, a lunatic fringe despot. Intelligent man, but he didn't play with a full deck. Yet, that is the theological founder of free trip. So now we come to our next problem, eschatology. Pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. Pre-millennial, amillennial, post-millennial. Let's look at these things. Pre-tribulationism says, the return of the Lord is imminent. There are no more signs of his return. He can come at any moment. Now, technically, that would mean events in the Middle East are not necessary for the return of Christ, that the rebirth of Israel was not necessary for the return of Christ because of imminency. You can come in and wait a minute. Zechariah 12, 1 to 10, Matthew 23, 39 and 40, Luke 21, 24, much of the book of Revelation, the Jews have to be in Jerusalem for Christ to return. That's one of their problems. Their second problem is they make two words synonymous that aren't. They must take the Greek word for tribulation, philipsis, or great tribulation, megathelipson, and make it a synonym with the word for wrath, orge. Paul says, we're not appointed unto wrath. We are not. But Jesus said, you'll have tribulation in the world. And he says, it is after the great tribulation of those days, he will send his angels to gather his elect that the rapture happens. That's the plain meaning. Now again, we know that that's what the early church believed. Irenaeus, who got his doctrine from Polycarp, or he got his doctrine from the Apostle John directly, Polycarp, and Irenaeus got it from John via Polycarp. They said this is what John taught, that we would have to know who the Antichrist is before the rapture can happen. That's what the early Christians believed. That's what the earliest people who were connected historically, who knew the apostles, said the apostles taught. You either believe what the apostles taught, or you believe Darby's nonsense. There are many debates whether or not he was influenced by Margaret MacDonald from the Irvinites. This is a whole other issue. But what's for sure is Philipsis and Orge are not synonyms. Pre-trib says, and mid-trib says, that the entire final seven years by the lunar calendar of history, the 70th week of the prophet Daniel's vision from Daniel chapter 9, the full seven years is the tribulation or great tribulation. And that equals wrath. Nowhere does Scripture say that the full seven years is the tribulation. And nowhere does the Scripture say that tribulation equals wrath. In fact, 
the text draws a distinction between tribulation and wrath. There's also a term, paresmos, the trial that's coming. Well, let's look at this. We're not appointed unto wrath. The wrath of God is the day of the Lord. It is inaugurated by the rapture and resurrection. Once the faithful church is removed and the resurrection takes place, God pours out his wrath on the kingdom of Antichrist and turns his purposes back to saving Israel and the Jews primarily. You've got people today saying insane things. Again, a different meaning to the term. You have people absurdly stating that the term apostasy in 2 Thessalonians, the day of the Lord won't come to the apostasy comes first, and the Antichrist is revealed, the man of lawlessness, the anthropone nomos, and so forth. Oh, that means the rapture. The apostasy is the rapture. What? Speaking in the context of the return of Christ in Timothy, Paul uses the same term apostasy, and it plainly means a falling away from the faith. No place in Scripture does the term apostasy mean a special departure. All they can say is the underlying Greek term apostemi can mean a spatial departure, but no place does Scripture say it's a departure. As the pre-tribulational apologist himself, Dr. Mark Hitchcock, who's both a, a a lawyer and a theologian stated, if the apostasy w was going to be the rapture, it would say the harpezo, the snatching away. It wouldn't use the word apostasy. He's pre-trib, but he's right. These people are teaching utter nonsense. They're doing a hatchet job on the word of God. It is asegetical lunacy. They're reading into the scriptures things that don't say, and they're ignoring what it does say. Pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib. The mid-trib people think it means, well, Jesus is coming at the halfway mark through the seven years. Wait a minute. We can't know the day or the hour. And, of course, if you could calculate when the tribulation begins by some kind of a treaty, the argument goes, that the Antichrist makes with Israel, if that's what's going to happen, if that's what it means, if that's how people interpret Daniel, you'll be able to know the day. So therefore, pre-trib people can say this about mid-trib people, that they're wrong because it would let us know the day. Mid-trib people are also wrong. Yes, we cannot know the day or the hour, that's for sure. But... Tribulation is not the full seven years. Revelation breaks itself up into sets of seven. Seven seals, seven trumpets, seven peals of thunder, and seven vials. It breaks itself up between the beginning of birth pangs, the tribulation, great tribulation, and the day of his wrath, the day of the Lord. In the beginning of birth pangs, there's tribulation, but it's not yet the great tribulation. That's when the Antichrist shows up. Then there's the day of his wrath, when God removes the faithful church, turns his purposes primarily back to Israel, and deals with the Antichrist. This will be addressed in my next book, What Really Happens After the Rapture. No bomb in Gilead. Very lengthy subject. So, the pre-trib people mean it's before the seven years. The mid-trib people mean it's halfway through when the rapture happens. And the post-trib people mean it's at the end. you got a problem. They mean different things by tribulation. Yes, the Lord does come at the tribulation. But that's not at the end of the seven years. The end of the tribulation, obviously, I would say obviously, and so would others, is between the sixth and seventh seal. In Revelation chapter 7, that's 
conspicuously the rapture and resurrection. Yes, post-trib is true, but that does not mean at the end of seven years. Different people mean different things by the same terms. Are you post-tribulational? Yes, but that doesn't mean it's going to happen at the end of the seven years. It means it happens during it. Again, I won't go into that any further. They're using the terms differently than the scripture does. We're not appointed unto wrath. We won't be here for that. Not the faithful church, anyway. But let's move on. Premillennial. Premillennial believes that the original plan that God had for planet Earth and for mankind, and also, on another level, his original plan for Israel and the Jews, must still take place on Earth for a thousand-year period before eternity. The plan of God cannot be thwarted by the sin of man or the designs of Satan. God had an original plan for planet Earth and the human race, and it must still happen. He will restore the world to its Adamic state. People born at that time will have a fallen nature, but they will not have the world or the devil will be bound to tempt them. Then, God had a plan for Israel. What would have happened had the Jews accepted the Messiah? Well, the millennium will be like that. Jesus reigning from Jerusalem with David, his subordinate, as a prince. That's what the second half of Ezekiel largely talks of, the Levitical function of the Jews during the millennium and of other believers co-reigning with Christ and so forth. This is premillennialism. The early Christians were premillennial. They all believed that Jesus would have to come and do this. Remember, we have two kinds of prophecies of the Messiah. Son of Joseph, that is the suffering servant prophecies, and the son of David, the conquering king prophecies, Hamashiach ben Yosef and Hamashiach ben David. Jesus only fulfilled the suffering servant prophecies in his first coming in the character of Joseph from the book of Genesis. He must still come and set up his messianic kingdom. That's what the apostles were asking him. Lord, is it at this time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel like it says in Ezekiel? Not for you to know the times of the seasons. It's going to happen. Your mission is evangelism, discipleship, preaching the gospel. Okay, but it still must happen. For Jesus to be the Christ, Yeshua must be the Messiah. He must fulfill all of the Old Testament prophecies, both the suffering servant prophecies and the conquering king prophecies. He must fulfill both the son of David prophecies as well as the son of Joseph prophecies. He must come as Hamashiach ben Yosef in his first coming and Hamashiach ben David in his second. That's what the early church believed. All of this other post-millennial and amillennial hogwash, for want of a better term, and I'm trying to be euphemistic, because that's what it is, was invented again after the time of Constantine. Oh, his kingdom has come. It's the Roman Empire that's turned to Christendom. The patristic Christianity of the post-Nicene fathers, Constantine and the Emperor Justinian and all this stuff. This is what, this is where the denial of premillennialism originated. Then there are amillennialists. They say it's all symbolic and has no actual meaning. It's not literally a thousand years. So. No. Do you believe the seven years is literal? Yes. Do you believe the 1,345 days is literal? Yes. Okay, in Revelation, do you believe the 1,260 days are literal? Yes. Okay, so you believe uh, the seven churches were seven literal, the numbers were literal? Yes. You believe all these other time periods? Two times a time and a half time, 1,260 days, 42 months. You believe all this stuff was literal? Yes. 
then why not the thousand years? Their hermeneutic is inconsistent. Remember, if there's no millennium, Yeshua is not the Messiah. And if Yeshua is not the Messiah, Jesus is not the Christ. Do not believe a millennial nonsense. And do not believe a wrong definition of post-millennialism. Post-millennialism says the kingdom has come. This is what happened with the time of Constantine. This was the Dark Ages, the papacy of the Middle Ages. This was the Byzantian Empire. And this today is Dominion Theology. It's the New Apostolic Reformation. It was the Kansas City False Prophets. Paul Cain, the homosexual alcoholic. And Bob Jones, the womanizer. This was their theology. Propagated by the Vineyard Movement and the late John Wimber. The ecumenical John Wimber. That's where this stuff comes from. It is all false. The early church was premillennial. Understand the difference between premillennial, postmillennial, and amillennial. Amillennial says there is no thousand years. Postmillennial says it happens in the age of the church. Well, if Satan is bound, I want to know who keeps letting him go. Additionally, we all know of Y2K, but there was a Y1K. In the year 999 Anno Domine, A.D., that was nearly the end of the millennium. So Catholics began giving their money, their lands, their castles to the Pope because Jesus was coming at the end of the millennium, 1008D. Nobody got their money back. It's all a nonsense. Understand the terms. Premillennial, postmillennial, amillennial. Premillennialism is true. Understand the terms. Pre-tribulational rapture, mid-tribulational rapture, post-tribulational rapture. The rapture is post-tribulational, but that's not at the end of the seven years. The end of the seven years is the finality, the closing of the day of his wrath, the day of the Lord. The middle portion of the seven years, or the central portion, is the Great Tribulation. Christians will be here for the four horsemen of the apocalypse. They will see the Antichrist, who comes, as it were, on a white horse in Revelation 6, counterfeiting the return of Christ on a white horse in Revelation 1920. When Jesus comes back, as it were, the third time after the rapture, the saints are with him, and the millennial kingdom is established. So we have pre, post, and mid. Tribulationism. Know the terms. We have premillennial, amillennial, and postmillennial. The early Christians were premillennial. That's the truth. But know the terms. Thank you so much.